Recording in progress. words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Let's be seated. You'll turn to Acts chapter 10. I mentioned a minute ago, Christopher and I did go to Methkin Abbey this past week. I was trying to figure out, um, I started going there in December of 1994. So actually this year will be the 30th anniversary of my uh, first visit to Methkin Abbey. But I was trying to figure out how many times, because that was people were asking that in the introductory session, how many times you've been here so far. So I was trying to calculate and taking out the couple of years um, after Amanda and uh, Father Chris and Miranda and I closed the place down in March of 2020. <laughs> uh, they closed it down for almost a little over a year and then they had limited access for a year. So uh, there were a couple of years there when I didn't attend. But anyway, I figured out tentatively that I have been to Mepkin Abbey 54 times, okay? And Every visit has been different. There's been something new, something different at every visit there. Um, but the one key is seeking spiritual communion with God, just seeking that spiritual insight that comes from him alone. And this time was no different. Um, I had taken some books for meditation purposes, and I tried them both, and neither one of them were doing it. And I knew I was going to be preaching this Sunday. So I said, okay, Lord, well, I'm just going to go to the scriptures for Sunday and see what you have to say. And I got this insight, okay? We're in John chapter 10 for the gospel today. And the Lord very clearly showed me that chapter 10 of John's gospel is preceded by chapter 9. Ooh, ooh, what a thought. Wow. Now, that that that's good i mean okay see chapter 10 continues the message of chapter 9 is really so if you're going to understand chapter 10 you've got to go back to chapter 9 so i went back to chapter 9 and what happens in chapter 9 obviously is there is a man who was born blind and he is healed by jesus the jews don't want to believe this they keep saying, well, no, he must not have actually been blind. They talked to uh, his parents, and let's get rid of that. Thank you very much. Um, he, they talked to his parents. They call him in. Then they call him in a second time, and he kind of gets in their face. If you look at uh, John 9, 34, wrong page. To this, they re when he gets in their face, they say, to this... Uh, John says, to this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? Hmm. And they threw him out. They threw him out of the synagogue. Well, Jesus had heard that they threw him out. And he went and found him and said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Now, late, going on a little further, uh, he's talking about blindness. And some of the Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see your guilt remains. And then flipping over into chapter 10, Jesus continues this dialogue, this uh, discourse. And he says, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep in, etc., etc." It's just a continuation of this. And as a matter of fact, I was kind of surprised this morning when I looked, when I was doing the study this week, I was reading from the NIV that's in 
uh, the Bible Gateway, and that doesn't match the NIV we've got right here. It's they, kind of they, strange. They, they, it's an updated, yeah. yeah they, but they say in the updated version, uh, truly I say to you, Jesus says to the Pharisees. So he's talking to the Pharisees. It doesn't say that in the Greek, but they put that in the NIV. Yeah, he's talking to the Pharisees. <laughs> He's also talking to the man who was born blind, who is now healed and can see. He was talking to his disciples, and he's talking to you and me. And it's very important for us to recognize he's speaking to all of us. And so in chapter 10, we have this message that is for the whole church, okay? And Jesus is speaking to all of us. But let's look at the different groups here. The Pharisees. What is he saying to the Pharisees? The Pharisees were blind guides, thieves and robbers, according to Jesus. And he says, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. He's right in the Pharisees' face. He's saying, you aren't, you aren't playing by the understanding of the Holy Spirit. You're not listening to God, okay? They don't have, here's the problem. They don't have a theology that's big enough to include God actually healing somebody without their participation in it as the Jewish ruling leaders. Their theology is so limited, they can't see beyond the, the confines of the Jewish faith as they have it, and as they understand it. And so, boom, they are blind guides, okay? Now, back when we had the, the pandemic going on, you remember there was a lot of question about what we were going to do. They were closed, you know, the, the state was closing everything down. And could we come together and meet and pray together and have Eucharist and all that? And essentially, you know, the city was saying, no, 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 you can't do this. You can't do this. And I was talking to a number of different clergy all around the nation in the CEC, and one of them said, I don't give a darn uh, what the government tells me I can and cannot do. I don't have a theology that allows me to do that. It sounded just so familiar to John chapter 9. Hmm, okay. And I actually, the reason why I remembered this is I was reading in my journal this week and I got back to when we were in, going through the pandemic. And here's what I wrote in my journal after having that conversation with that individual. I wrote in my journal that if we are relying on proven theology for ongoing ministry, then we are not being open to the Holy Spirit's leading. We need to be led where the sh shepherd would have us go. And if you'll remember, we, the rector's council prayed through that and we decided we would do it the way we ended up doing it. That's how we ended up with Zoom and all this stuff too. I'm not sure I like that part of it, but that's okay. It, you know, where the sh shepherd leads, we have to go. All right. And this Luddite is learning how to follow the shepherd. <laughs> okay. Anyway, G Father uh, Christopher was telling me too while we were down there at Mepkin about G.K. Chesterton and uh, what G.K. Chesterton said about daisies that God creates every daisy every day anew. Okay. And that ultimately every daisy is unique. Each one is unique, but God creates everyone. He doesn't get tired of creating because that's who he is. I mean, even think about it. There are no two snowflakes alike. God in his ultimate creative humor makes them all different and billions and billions of them. And you know, it thrills him. He loves it. He's happy. He's in Revelation chapter 1, verse 15, it says, Behold, I make all things new. 
Just like the new songs we sang. I make all things new. The good shepherd leads us in pathways that will take us to places where we can have new experiences. We're not going to like all of them, but they're new experiences. And there's new ways of seeing the Lord. And there's new ways of seeing the world, world we live in. And he leads us in biblically sound pathways. You know, when people start saying, well, I want to try something completely new, completely different. Uh, be careful. If it's a completely new theology, it's probably heretical. Okay. So we go down the pathways that the Lord leads us. The good shepherd guides us. That's what we need to do. And God will never disappoint us. Now, let's look at the man who was healed. The man who was healed, his life was transformed in a moment of time by Jesus' healing. Well, was that a good thing? Hmm. He was a beggar. All he had to do was lay down his cloak and people would throw money at him. And then Jesus comes along and heals him. So he can no longer sit there and beg because nobody's going to throw coins to a man who can see. Hmm. And he gets confronted by the Jewish authorities. And he's cast out of the synagogue. So he's lost his means of income. He's lost his place in the community. What options does he have now? He has the option of following the good shepherd. Where the good shepherd will lead him. The good shepherd is good. He will never lead you in pathways that are bad for you. Okay. Now that brings us to the point of the good shepherd. The good shepherd and the sheep. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Now, I thought about doing this, and I thought, anyway, you all know the, the seven I am statements. John and John, there are seven statements that Jesus makes that I am. I'll give you a hint, and then you tell me what it is, okay? In chapter six, Jesus says, I am. Come on, come on, come on. I am. You got it. Go ahead. The bread of life. I am the bread of life. Good man. Toss that man a quarter. Okay. That's chapter six. Chapter eight. I am. Nope. I am. The light of the world. There you go. Okay, and then we go to chapter 10 and we get two I am's. In chapter 10, we get I'm the good shepherd, yes, but what comes before oh, the good shepherd? Gate. I am the gate, I am the door of the, the sheep. Door. Okay, so now we've got four. Okay, in chapter 11, it's about Lazarus, and I am the resurrection and the life. There you go. Okay, all right, and then we have chapter 14. Is that finally the true vine? No. no, no that's life. That's I am the way and the, truth. and the truth and the life. And then we have I am the true vine in chapter 15. Okay, anyway. Side note. Sheep shepherd. Good, Jesus is the good shepherd. We are the sheep. I had to go, <laughs> I had to go look up some things about sheep okay and i found a fabulous website and it's a it's a legitimate website on how to raise sheep okay and it's called sheep 101 <laughs> and there is a follow-up website by the son who did of the man who did sheep 101 and it's sheep 201 <laughs> okay? anyway it's really cool but, you know, sheep are communal animals. They really are. They're communal animals. And what he was saying in Sheep 201 about the community of the sheep is 
that if a sheep loses sight, a lamb loses sight of all the others, if he cannot see another sheep, uh -huh. he goes into panic mode and he starts shedding all of his wool and he just, it, it, he endangers himself, okay? They have to be with each other. They have to spend time together. And ultimately you need five sheep minimally for a productive flock. Oh. Why five? I don't know, but there you go. Oh, anyway, okay. and also sheep follow each other. If one sheep starts moving around, all the rest of them will follow. And shepherds have to be aware of that. And that's why they have sheep dogs too, to keep the sheep from wandering away. Yeah. Okay. And there was a really sad story that he um, included about the sheep following other sheep. In Eastern Turkey, where apparently sheep herd, uh, sheep, how do you do? You don't herd sheep. What do you do with sheep? Yeah, you, uh, heard them. you heard them? Okay. Anyway, uh, but anyway, where the sheep herders are, are very prominent, apparently, there was a, a shepherd who had a large flock of sheep, about 400 sheep, and he had a heart attack and died. And the sheep started wandering and one of them started kind of leading the way and all 400 just followed right behind this one. And unfortunately this sheep wasn't terribly smart and he came to a 15 meter cliff and just walked off and all the rest of them just walked off and 400 sheep ended up at the bottom of the ravine because they were following the shep the one sheep. So a sheep without shepherd is not a good thing. Causes chaos. Yeah, that's chaos. You got it. That's right. Okay. All right. So when the good shepherd does something for one sheep, though, he's doing it for the whole flock. Yeah. Because what affects one affects the whole. All right. Um, and so when Jesus is making a point by saying, I am the good shepherd, it's very important to recognize that what he's doing is he's calling back to the Old Testament concepts of shepherding. You hear about it in Ezekiel, you hear about it in today's Psalm, Psalm 23. And it's also hearkening back all the way to Moses at the burning bush, because he says, I am, ego e me in Greek, but Yahweh in Hebrew, I am. It's the name of God. And he's saying, as a matter of fact, in verse 30 of today's gospel, he says, I and the Father are one. I am. And I am the good shepherd. And so let's look at what it says about the shepherd in Psalm 23. The Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. What happens? I shall not want he provides. You don't have to be afraid. And then he makes me lie down in green pastures. I think it's interesting that it, the way it's worded there is he makes us lie down. We get so busy about so many things. We don't take time to be nourished by the Lord. And so he makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. And there he can restore our souls. He leads me in paths of righteousness. That's wonderful. But it's, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And then it goes on. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. What am I doing wandering through the valley of the shadow of death? Sheep. You're a sheep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're following the shepherd. And sometimes the shepherd needs to take us through the valley of the shadow of death because there are things to which we need to die. There are things in our lives that need to die in order that we might be resurrected. And so he leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. And we don't need to be afraid. We fear no evil. For the shepherd is with us. He will guide us. He will protect us. Okay? And... Without those deaths, we will not rise with him. His rod and his staff, a rod is a disciplinary tool. 
And a staff is a sign of rule, a, a scepter, as it were. Okay? His rod and his staff comfort me. I'm comforted by his discipline. I'm comforted by being under his reign and his rule. For he is the good shepherd. And he prepares a table before me. Oh, that's wonderful. In the presence of my enemies. Oh, that's not quite what I was looking for. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Because he's showing the love that he has for us and for all mankind through us to those who are enemies of the cross of Christ. My cup overflows, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All right. So he is the good shepherd. And John chapter 10, verse 10, which is the verse that immediately precedes today's gospel, Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. We need to be willing to go where the shepherd leads in order to have that life. And that inevitably involves, I know it's a dirty word, but here it is, change. I like things the way they are. I don't like change, but there are things that need to change. There are things that God wants to do. And without that change, those things will not happen. If we are living, if we are truly alive in Christ, then we are growing. We are, by definition, changing. We are not in a stagnant state. But unfortunately, all too often, particularly, sadly, in the church, Jesus is maybe saying in his brain, I came that they may have life, but they have chosen perpetual stagnation. And that's a sad commentary. But unfortunately, all too true. Well, we've never done it that way way before those are the seven deadly words okay <laughs> we've never done it that way before well maybe the lord is inviting us to a new experience in him all right well just like my 54 visits to mepkin abbey and every one of those being different and unique experience of the lord there are no reruns. There are no encores in our spiritual journey. All too often I hear somebody saying, well, I had this fabulous experience with the Lord and I really want to live it again. No, you had that experience with the Lord. He's got something new for you. He's got a new song for you to sing. He's got a new way for you to, to look at the world and to minister in his name. There are no reruns. There are no encores. There are never two spiritual experiences that are exactly alike because God is doing something new. Behold, I make all things new. Well, the good shepherd invites us to follow him as he leads us in paths in his name. And we can be like the Pharisees and blind thieves and robbers, or we can be like the man who was healed. And embrace the total transformation of our life in Jesus. Or we can be like the sheep. And rejoice in being committed to the shepherd and to the community of faith. Amen. Yes, Eleanor. Yes. <laughs> 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 must change. Uh, <laughs>